Welcome to the fourth edition of IIT Gandhinagar's course on Indian knowledge systems. Uh, this year, the theme is the ancient idea of India. And we're going to explore how India perceived herself in ancient times. And um, uh, in particular, through a variety of fields, not just literature, but also uh, technology, science, uh, the arts, historiography, and uh, today with Professor Srinivas Reddy, uh, polity. That is to say, the, the political concepts of governance and sometimes economics that were at play in India. We've all heard of Arthashastra, but we may not know that these concepts spread across India and uh, with some variations, of course, some differences here and there, but there was ultimately a shared idea of what a ruler was to do and how he was to do it. So uh, I'm very glad to introduce uh, our own faculty and uh, my dear friend, Professor Srinivas Reddy, who is not only guest professor at IIT Gandhinagar, but occasionally teaches also at Brown University in the US, among other places. He's a well-known scholar of Sanskrit literature, of uh, classical Telugu, classical Tamil, and also classical music, being himself uh, a, perform a performer at the sitar. So with this brief introduction, I request you, uh, Srini, to please tell us your, your view of ancient Indian polity and uh, some contrast perhaps between different regions of India. Thank you very much, very much, Professor Danano, Michelle, my dear friend. And uh, uh, as you all know, this is a, a, a rebroadcast, so things are a little bit different. But th this theme of renewing, redoing, repetition, this is actually part of the theme of, of what we'll discuss. So. It's actually in line with everything we're going to do. Um, but just like I've been doing lately, um, and it's good for all of us, let us have dominant shanti of just a little bit of silence to settle ourselves and have a good sankalpa that the talk will go well and we can have a good discussion. So here we go, dominant shanti.
Okay, thank you very much. As my gurus always say to me, because I'm a talkative fellow, Maunyam Sarvartha Sadhanam. Of course, now I'm going to talk for a long time, so it's a little bit ironic, but still. Here we go. I'll start the presentation. And um, move it to the... Can you all see this politics and ethics in India? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So this is, uh, well, you know, the, even the fact that politics and ethics, to see those two words together, especially in this day and age, uh, it probably is a very important thing that we need to consider because in the Indian system, politics and ethics they actually kind of arose from a similar types of consideration because ethics really grew out of, in certain sense, um, the idea of governance and and how uh, a society could be, you know, put together and and adhered. So the, it's interesting that these two things are being discussed, and and like many things, you know, <clears throat> everything has like a a renewed re uh, you know resonance um year after year so it, it is kind of interesting that we're revisiting this and you know the first slide even from the the, la the first time the presentation was made was about this marga desi double helix uh which had come up in a previous iks lecture which then of course became the theme for a, a subsequent iks lecture so it, this is really at the heart i really think of I mean, not only just Indian culture, but culture generally and how culture works, what we think of as culture. It's just that it's it's fascinating that in the Indian context, the the theoreticians, the the you know, that's the scholarly apparatus that was developed in India had already addressed this from a very ancient period. And the idea of, of Marga is the kind of formal way, the kind of theory, the, you know, the kind of fixedness uh, of things, and Desi, which is regional, um, you know, variable, uh, localized, um, you know, ever-changing, all of these kinds of contrasts. This is basically, it sets up the, the classic dialectic. And the dialectic is not something that is a matter of opposition. Uh, the dialectic is a dialogue. It requires both of these things to be moving together, just like the you know DNA. You need both of those strands to create those bridges of, and it's through that bridging of these two, the dialogue between these two, that um, you know we that culture evolves. Because, and and I cannot stress this point enough. Um, because even even still, I mean, I, I have to say, we still kind of carry these ongoing feelings that you know, you know, there was Sanskrit and and all these languages derived from Sanskrit, and or that you know the the, the great tradition is is up here somewhere, and that the little traditions are are like kind of de evolutions of that, but. There's re I, I really would not look at it in that hierarchical way. I would look at it more in this horizontal way of, of, of dialogue together because, I mean, even with Sanskrit, I was just thinking you know, when I was, was saw this slide, you know, samskritam, it means refined, right? And to refine something, you need something to refine. There has to be something that there already. And that thing came from nature. That is prakrita. So if you actually just even sit and read... Or, or or analyze and understand what even Panini, someone like Panini is doing, who's really a, a landmark figure because he really defines what Sanskrit is, um, not only in a grammatical way, but in a concept, conceptual way. I mean, fundamentally, Sanskritam is, 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 again, as the word means, artificial, is a type of kind of classicalization, a formalization of a Prakrit. Of one particular register of speech that, or, or, or of discourse that was common at that time, so Sanskrit didn't just appear perfect at the beginning and then de-evolve into Prakrits. It's actually quite, in fact, more of the inverse. The Prakrits were naturally existing, and Sanskritam was was perfected out of that. 
So, and then of course there was dialogue going on between these two. So I just want to stress this point and, and it'll, and this will come up in terms of what I'll talk about in, in terms of the Niti dialogue and how that also has, you know, what we would say classical versus vernacular uh, iterations. So this, this point, I can't stress enough of the Marga Desi, you know, dialogue um, is really important. And I think this came up in one of the talks just out of nowhere. And I think uh, Professor Dan and I both have enjoyed using this. You know, it's like, it's the DNA of the culture. It's the DNA of the culture. You know, it, it's, it's imprinted in the way that things have evolved over time. So that's just something to think about overall. Okay, so today we're going to discuss Artha. And first we want to look at the meaning of Artha. And Artha, of course, means meaning itself. So Artha means meaning, but it, 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 it means many other things. I mean, the old Sanskrit saying is every word means a hundred things and there's a hundred ways to say one thing. And uh, <laughs> it's really true, which which creates a lot of richness and also a lot of <laughs> complication. But both are good. So in this case, Artha, uh, you know, it, it also means, you know, your goal, your purpose, your objective, your motive. It also means money, straight up, prosperity, wealth, all of those things. Um, so sometimes the Artha Shastra, that is the science or scientific text, written about artha is often translated as you know you know the science of money or the science of wealth or economics and all of that but it's quite a lot more than that um it does have a lot to do with economics there, there there's a good part about uh, money and finance and and how that's important not only to uh, society but the state and how it's organized how funds and finances are organized is very important but it's a lot more than that. And it, it, you know, it really does, in many ways, also address, you know, the purpose of, of our lives and especially our social life, you know, vis-a-vis -vis like a citizen as, as a part of a society. So I think in many ways to me, Arthashastra is about society um, in, in the various ways that we can think of that. And particularly in terms of society and governance. And these are really key themes that you know, uh, we're, we're grappling with all the time through all, all points in history. So like, like these Sanskrit words that can mean many things, people can also have many names. So Arthashastra we know was written by maybe someone named Kautilya, maybe someone named Vishnugupta, maybe someone named Chanakya. Sometimes he's called Tantrakara. Um, so there's many names and we don't need to go into all the details and there is a lot of, um, I know, good scholars doing work on all of these things. Um, but the, the main point is that there was a large amount of scientific, Shastrik is scientific, this is not Kavya now, this is not, uh, you know, creative writing. This, this is like hardcore writing about di a discipline. Um, and so, you know, whoever wrote it, uh, that that's not what we're going to discuss today. But what they wrote is, is what we're discussing. And what they're talking about is, is the important thing. However, I do want to also stress that, you know, it's not like the Arthashastra had a linear kind of history, like always present in the minds of Indians and Indian kings throughout history. There was kind of a loss, and then there was this kind of great discovery of an old manuscript of Arthashastra, then it was translated, and there's a whole history to that too. But And I won't get into all of that either, but I do want to stress again this point of loss, discovery, and renewal. <laughs> and of course, that also you know adds a humorous touch to the fact that you know, the first iteration of this talk was lost, and now we're kind of rediscovering it, and hopefully it will renew some discussion. Um, but the point is that this theme, this is another big theme in India, and I was kind of, I kind of even talked about it in the other lecture. Loss is also a type of gain. And, and we, if we can see that, then I think we also understand how Indian knowledge actually works. I mean, if you look at any um, Shastra, Kavya, anything, you know, Tulsi Ramayan, uh, Brahat Katha, all of these things, different things, this Artha Shastra, there's always some kind of little story about how there was a big text, 
it was lost. Some parts were, you know, disappeared or burnt or drowned or whatever. And then we recovered something. And that recovered thing is like really special. So there's this idea of some kind of, you know, degradation over time. And yet through that degradation, we also get an idea of preservation and a kind of, you know, blossoming of something really important. Um, so anyway, this is, again, another little theme to think about. We won't get too much into detail because I really want to focus on some of the poems and give you a real direct sense of, of what I'm talking about. Okay. So, oh yeah, this is the other word. Niti is the other word we really need to discuss. Um, niti comes from the verbal dhatu, ni to lead. So, you know, literally it is like guidance. That's a good, actually, I think a good translation because it also relates to that um, verbal root. But as you can see, it can mean many, many things. This is from, I think, uh, Opte's uh, Sanskrit dictionary. Um, it's direction, it's your conduct, your, you know, decorum, the way you are. It also, you know, gets into as you see in definition eight, the science of morality, morals, ethics, moral philosophy, governments, governance, particularly that's what we call like Rajaniti. So politics, political science, statesmanship, political wisdom, all of this can be subsumed under this, you know, bigger category of Niti. So, you know, and, 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 and really the, the heart of it, if I could bring it back to that word about guidance, and you'll see this in the, the poems that I'll uh, quote from Krishnadevaraya, who's a very good example of this, is you have to, you know, you know, morality, that is not something that one just states or, or, or enforces. Morality is someone you lead by example. That's what it is. A leader is one who walks the walk and then others will follow. So if you want to be a good leader in the Indian sense, you have to embody in your own life those principles which you so espouse. And I think that's really a very special part of the idea of Niti, that, it, that, that at the highest level, at, at the governance level, let us say, one must practice what they preach. That's really what Niti is about. Um, one other side point, this uh, specula principium, principum, this, this idea, this is called like mirror for princes. This is a whole set of texts that were popular throughout the Western world. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking even like Machiavelli, the prince, you know, that, that's like the classic, you know, text. Um, but basically these were texts written to educate young princes on how they should kind of lead um, uh, a moral, ethical life when they become the king and therefore, you know, lead, uh, you know, have a good um, kind of righteous uh, rule. Uh, and this tradition is very common even in India and was for a very long time. Um, and that's really, it comes, you know, from a very old tradition from Panchatantra, Hitopadesha, Jatakas, these, all of these, you know, even, you know, a lot of them are animal stories. But these small, small animal stories, they weren't just stories to, to be entertaining. The whole point of all of those stories is to encode some kind of moral principle. And they were told in these animal story method because, you know, young boys learning would, you know, easily pick these things up and understand. So it, it was it was a type of training. So this is how the old way of, of training princes was done. And this is also common even in the Western tradition. All right, let's keep going. Um, and I'm just watching out on the time. So the, the, the Arthashastra um, certainly, you know, was not, even though we don't have like a, a, a clear linear textual kind of history for it, it was certainly well known. I mean, you know, Kalidasa, he's the one that actually quotes the, the, the use of that word Tantakara in regard to Kautilya. So, I mean, th there was knowledge about the Arthashastra for a long time. And it's very clear that Krishnadevaraya was probably familiar with some of those verses himself, being a Sanskrit scholar. Um, and just to remind, Krishnadevaraya was the emperor of uh, Vijayanagara Empire uh, at the beginning of the 16th century. And uh, he wrote a huge Mahakavya called the Amukta Malyada. 
And within the Amuk Tamalyada, there's a whole, I think, 89 verses which are dedicated to Rajaniti. So that's like political, um, you know, science, political morality, political ethics. Um, and here is the point I want to bring back the idea of Marga Desi. Because at one level we have, you know, the great Arthashastra, that's the, you know, the Sanskrit text, that's it, that's the Shastra. That defines what political theory is going to be for now and forever. Um, and as in all things Indian, nothing ever dies. Nothing ever just goes away. Nothing supplants something and subsumes it in totality. That thing always stays. It remains. It's a base. It's a foundation. So you don't get rid of your, your foundation. You build upon it. And that is the Indian way. And in that way, what Krishnadevaraya does is he builds upon these basic principles, but he updates them. He reformulates certain things. He recontextualizes certain things so that they are applicable to his 16th century reality. So I'll read you this quote that kind of summarizes that point. Uh, this is from uh, a paper that Narayan Rao, David Chulman, and Sanjay Subramanian did for, I forget which volume. I think it was, actually, I think it came from Pondicherry uh, volume. But anyway, here's the quote about Krishnadevaraya's Rajaniti. Partly rooted in pragmatic experience, partly creatively adapting the existing literature of Niti statecraft, this is no armchair pontificating, but a largely practical synthesis reflecting the political, economic, and institutional changes of the early 16th century. Still, highly individualized statements that can be attributed directly to the book's author do alternate with verses that seem to be lifted from standard Neethi text about politics and kingship. Nonetheless, we are left with a total impression of a unique concoction of pragmatic wisdom, specific constraints, an inherited normative politics, and a meditative sensibility capable of formulating something entirely new. So this, I like this quote. It, it, it really sums up what I was trying to get at is that it's, it's working at multiple levels. So there is a sense that, you know, first of all, this was written by the king himself. So it wasn't a, a didactic kind of thing written by a minister, let us say, as, you know, a guidebook for a, a, an or a early 16th century king. No, this was the king himself experiencing things at court, on the battlefield, in the field, anywhere in his life, and incorporating that lived experience into his knowledge of the theoretical aspect of, you know, statecraft as maybe had, he had learned as a young prince. So there, there's an I, there's the whole point, and this kind of you know relates back to the the talk I gave about Marga and Desi and music. You know, theory and practice. That's what Marga and Desi really come down to, theory and practice, and the dialogue that happens between theory and practice. When sometimes they get out a, a little out of line, you need to modify theory, then, then practice changes, you need to modify that, then theory comes, a new theory comes and, you know, influences the kind of practice that's being done. So like that, always in some kind of dialogic relationship. So having this in mind, let us now explore some verses from Krishnadevaraya's Rajaniti section in detail, which will give you a sense of the kinds of things he was thinking about, the kinds of things that probably Kautilya was also thinking about, and very much the same things that we're dealing with now in our modern political life. So wealth and war, these two things, uh, you know, are really at, at the heart of it all. Um, so, uh, you know, and then treasury, and, and that's why Arta, Arta is there. It's, I mean, money has been a major thing for all time. So when funds are depleted, this is from Artha Sastra, when funds are depleted and the empire falls on hard times, a king should replenish his treasury. So keeping a good treasury, keeping a good savings account was something that was always stressed uh, because you never know what can happen. You never know what can happen and you need this kind of, you know, financial security at hand. So here are a couple of verses 
um, where Krishna Devaraya speaks exactly and directly to this, uh, what do they call it, bandaron, the, 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 the treasury. So here's what he says about the budget, you know, uh, how, he, how he puts things uh, to use in, in terms of his uh, fiscal budget. Even if it is big, a quarter of the budget should go to the king's gifts and pleasures. Okay, so let me pause here for a second and, and state that this should not be taken as a, a type of extravagance. There is a, an element of that because so much of, of, of those days is, you know, what like Clifford Geertz would call, you know, the, 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 this, uh, the performative state, theater, of, the state of theater, theater state. You know, the idea that, you know, you have to kind of perform your governance. You have to perform your leadership. That is, you are on a type of stage and you have to appear a certain way. And that was very much how it was. I mean, like the, the vision of the king, um, you know, and this is something, you know, if you take like, you know, um, Versailles, you know, the building of Versailles, it was all about that. It was, it was, it was, it's just like, you know, the spectacle of it. And that was still a big part of, of, of how Indian kingship was. Um, and Mughals, of course, were like that too. So anyway, Krishna Devaraya took a lot of time to have nice things, to have a nice, beautiful, and gorgeously decorated palace. And part of this budget also went to entertaining, you know, guests that would come, making them feel like they were in a, a beautiful place. So this was, it was pleasurable for him at, at a personal level, I'm sure. Um, and he talks about that in other places. But it was also part of the kind of performativity of governance. So that's important. So anyway, so, and, and he says this, even if it's big, a quarter of the budget should go to all of these gifts and pleasures. And gifts was another way that a king could you know, make alliances, uh, keep uh, loyalties in place, you know, gifting things to his lords was a big deal. Gifting things to potential enemies or new friends was important. Gifting things to, you know, these Portuguese, like we just heard about, these foreign travelers that would come was very, very important. So gifts were an important thing. And of course, keeping a kind of pleasurable place at, at the capital. So a quarter to gifts and pleasures, a half to maintain a powerful military. So that's, you know, uh, that's, he has to be very clear about that. And, and we'll get into some of the expenses in a second of the military. And then the rest of it, the remaining fourth, should go to savings. So he's putting a quarter of all of the budget into savings, which that also might seem like a big chunk. I mean, maybe that could be used for other things and... You know, what about all the, the, the works that you're going to need for, you know, building tanks, which is a big project that a uh, number of projects that he had. You know, what about all these things that you need to help all the people? Well, they all get involved. And again, I have to stress also that we have to read these verses, which are all written in a poetic kind of language, um, at one level as very real and very direct. And also another level as interpretable and, you know, kind of just general. Um, uh, statements and and maybe not always 100 percent uh, exactly what uh, the actual budget was. So we'd have to you know do more research on this. And there is some information from the Portuguese sources about how some of this money was was allocated. Um, but let's go to the next verse, which which really gets into um, how some of this military budget was was put to use. So this is a verse when he talks very directly about. Um, sp very specifically about uh, the Portuguese merchants. So when buying elephants, horses, or fodder, paying the salaries of good soldiers, honoring Brahmins, or indulging in personal pleasures, expense is not waste, it is gain. So the whole idea is, you know, you want to put money into the treasury and save, but when you spend, you should really spend it and spend it well and spend it on the important things that are going to keep the um, the empire afloat and, and, and prosperous. Um, and the first thing he mentions, I mean, elephants, yes, I mean, there were elephants already there, but the biggest expense, really, um, military expense, honestly, one of the biggest was horses, buying horses. At that time in Indian history, especially Deccany history, the, the horse was, was, it was like the tank, you know, it was like the 
thing that you needed in the military to win battles. So getting horses was critical, and by 1510, the Portuguese had, t- had taken Goa and had kind of started to redirect all maritime horse trade to Goa, which meant that basically if you wanted horses and you were a Deccany empire at that time, you had to deal with the Portuguese. So this was a, a major expense. Um, of course, paying salaries to the soldiers, all of that is important. And of course, he again mentions yeah, honoring Brahmins, which is also meant like religious functions and that kind of thing. Um, and then of course, he mentions his personal pleasures. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that you need to spend in order to, you know, flourish as well. Um, so that's very important. And and certainly um, he was a, he was a, a, I wouldn't say super indulgent, but he enjoyed uh, the pleasures of empire. So uh, on foreign trade, Domingo Pius was a horse trader that uh, Krishnadeva Raya met actually during the siege of the fort of Raichur. Um, which is a very uh, critical battle, actually, between uh, Vijayanagara and Bijapur. And, of course, you know, uh, Bijapur had the fort at that time, and they it was just an impenetrable fort, and they had these musketeers up there, and they were firing on the Vijayanagara guys as they were trying to get into the fort. And, and basically, Raya was stuck in a very long, drawn-out um, siege, that didn't seem like it was going to go anywhere. And then, lo and behold, a bunch of Portuguese musketeers showed up, including Domingo Paez, and they had better weapons with longer range and more accuracy, and they were quickly able to take out the the, the, the gunmen on the top of the turrets, and then, you know, the, the, the fort was easily taken. So the Portuguese um, were... were <clears throat> A very key player in in negotiating how Deccany warfare would play out, not only with their direct involvement, like in this case, but more so because, as Pius says, the whole business of the Portuguese was war. So if you had war going on, you needed people to buy guns, buy horses, do all this stuff, and the more demand there is, the more money that they could extract. So... Krishnadeva Raya understood this. He thanked Paez and his men for um, helping him win this battle. And then he invites them all back to the capital. And they wine and dine him. uh, Or he wines and dines them. And they have a really nice time. And then you have a verse right in his own Amukta And I mean, if you read my recent book, I I I make this point a lot. Is, you know, this is where the historical chronicles of, of... Portuguese merchants has a direct and very clear reflection in 16th century Telugu poetry. And I think this is a really important thing to think about when we think about um, Indian history and how it's told and how we kind of view sources in a type of hierarchy of of, of veracity. Um, So instead of I, again, instead of putting it into a hierarchy, if we can put it out onto a dialogue, I think we can really see how these things actually are talking to each other. So the verse from Raya is, merchants from distant lands who import elephants and war horses, they weren't importing elephants, by the way, just war horses. Um, of, of course, again, here's what I mean about the poetry, just to, to make a point about this. You know, like Gaja Ashwa, these two always come together. Gaja and Ashwa. So sometimes in the poetic language, you just put them together, although really he's talking about war horses only. So merchants from distant lands who import elephants and war horses should be kept in imperial service at the capital. Treat them with prestige and provide them with towns and mansions. Purchase their goods at a high price and ensure that your enemies are deprived of such resources. And and I I really love this verse because everything written in this verse is 100% historical, is 100% exactly what happened from all the other sources that we know. So these merchants from distant lands, they're the Portuguese, they're importing war horses, they were invited to the imperial capital, They were treated really well. They were given these special bungalows like in the new town that had just been built. 
and they were you know sent all sorts of wonderful things to eat and drink and uh, you know clothing and gifts of all kinds they were showered with all this kind of like love and you know the the real wine and dine kind of experience and because Krishna Devaraya had set aside so much money in his budget for this kind of military effort, he basically outbid the Bijapuris at this point in time and secured the a, a, basically an exclusive right at that time. And this didn't last uh, all, you know, until, well, after Raya, this kind of got com more complicated. But at least for him, he had exclusive rights. And that's one of the reasons why he was so successful, particularly against the northern sultans, because he had a direct inflow of these um, Central Asian war horses. All right. Now, the great uh, Purusharthas, Artha, of course, Kama, of course, and Dharma. Dharma is the, the basis of all of these. Um, and then Moksha actually, Moksha is actually not one of the original Purusharthas. Moksha comes later. It uh, gets involved in the discussion a little bit later. And as I discussed elsewhere, I, I do think that this is probably in relation to a type of... Um, formulation that would relate the purusharthas with the varnashrama dharmas um so but anyway that's a discussion for a different day the point i'm just trying to make is that well we saw a little bit of the kama already you know the king enjoying himself but artha and dharma really go together and you know we tend to think of money is kind of just a, a a comma type of thing just a pleasurable you know frivolous kind of, but no it's not really thought of in that way i mean prosperity you know being leading a full life in not just like a material sense but like a fullness of life you know um that you you take it all in that is the meaning i get from artha and this relates to dharma dharma in the sense of you know, dharma dharayati dharma, that, you know, the, the thing that sustains life. That is what dharma means, actually. Dharma is that which sustains something. It is It holds things up. So we're physical beings. We, we, need, we need food. We need material things. So this is also part of dharma. Um, and he says this, um, and he gets into it. So I'll read these two verses for you. The root purpose of an expansive empire is the acquisition of wealth. Now, again, I'm translating Artha there as just wealth, but I do believe it, mean, it means more than that. Um, and here he's getting into the kind of dharmic side of things as the sustenance of the society. But no matter how big your empire is, build tanks and canals for the benefit of farmers, ease taxes and grain revenues, be strong, and both artha and dharma will grow. So this dwandwa of artha and dharma is essential to his vision of what governance should be. Overdoing one is not good. When artha becomes just kama and pleasure, it's not good. Artha has to be, in a sense, a sir in service of dharma. So that everything is sustained and everything grows. In the next verse, um, this this verse gets at, at, at a very old and important Indian idea. Um, you know, the, the the king is Bhupala. You know, the, he he he's looking after the he's the protector of the land. Um, and, and the idea that the uh, you know, and the, this actually goes back to old Tamil ideas too, um, which I'm sure Raya is at some level. Uh, you know, also informed by. So the idea that, you know, the, 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 the king is like, you know, and even like Prithvi, the whole idea of Prithvi, you know, it, it's like the king and the earth. They're like wife and husband, like you're, you're just attached, you're connected. So the, the whole idea that the king and the earth are one is a very deep and ancient theme in Indian kind of, you know, conception of kingship. Um, so Rai even gets into this and he talks about how, you know, looking after one's health, one's own body, that's like the same thing as like being a good king. So a king should care for the empire like his own body for the two are one. 
the king should never forget to keep good health for affecting his body affects the empire. So the changes you make to yourself become the changes in the empire. Now this takes us right back to the first thing about what Niti is. Lead by example. You keep a clean body, you live a clean life, you live a prosperous, well-intentioned life, so too shall the you know, uh, uh, society be like that. Of course, this goes back to the classic, you know, um, yata raja tata prajaha. Yata raja tata prajaha. So as the king is, so too will the people be. So the, the king, you know, it's he, 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 he's, he's, he's the, you know, the metonym for the entire society. And so making sure that the king is leading a proper life, a dharmic life, will ensure that the empire will also be that way. Um, and uh, going more on to this, and, you know, Richard Eaton has written about this social egalitarianism um, as something that maybe was not evident as much in the older literature, but by the time we get to this medieval period, it really is kind of popping up the, the sense that like upliftment for all. Um, so I, I, this is another one, verse that I like a lot. I'll read it out. A king must listen to the cries of the destitute and care for their needs, whilst never entrusting such serious matters to cowards. He must always be ready to protect his people for a king keeps for if a king keeps the welfare of the people in his heart the people will care for the welfare of the king what's the benefit in this you might ask when people are high minded and united in their desires won't god who resides in the souls of all beings be giving well see so the, the god who re resides in also i think probably the word he's using there is you know antaryami you know the the in residing thing, so we're, we're not really talking about God and you know in, in, like a like a murti or a puja. We're talking about the inner consciousness. That's what it's about. So the idea that people, the government, all of them, we're all in it together, and that we all need to look after each other. You know. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Like that, like Kennedy said in his inaugural address. You know, these feelings of a symbiosis between people and governance, you know, is really at the heart of what I think Raya is trying to say here and, and really where, you know, it's there in the older stuff, but it really is like coming to the fore right now, um, at least the way I see it in, in the Indian kind of political history in the 16th century. Anyway, let's keep going. Oh, yeah. I did want to mention this because this is an interesting aspect of his political theory. Is a tribal policy. You know, and the, of course, we're still dealing with these things in India right now. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the kind of... Actually, there's, and this is not just one. There's a number of verses on this. But I'll just read these two out just so you get an idea that, you know, again, loss, renewal, discovery, all of these things, it's just like a cyclical process. Like, we need to remember where we were thinking about these things already and how we can think about them again in new ways. So, when hill tribes grow in strength, how can the king deal with the troubles caused to his people? They, that is the these hill tribes, they can be faithful but untrustworthy. And you can read the note about that. Uh, it's a very, it's a play on words. So again, here's where the po poetic side of things, sometimes you have to be careful about uh, how you translate things. But basically what he's saying is they can be very faithful, but sometimes untrustworthy, friendly, yet volatile, extremely hostile, or very kind. They can make little things into big ones. How? And then he says, when tribals offer rice pudding as a token of truth, they will never go back on their word. Do not become angry when you notice small faults in their behavior. Do not take this as a light matter, for the forest tribes are great of heart. So what he's really talking about is, you know, these guys are honorable people, but they just have somewhat of a different customs and different ways of doing things, and we need to respect that. Um, and like anyone, if you violate 
you know, someone's sense of propriety, you know, you're going to get, you're going to have problems. You're going to get uh, issues happen. And I think, I think I have a couple. Yeah, here's, here's some more verses. Finding the faults of forest tribes who live in the lower highlands of the empire is like trying to wash a mud wall. So here's that idea. Like you can't apply your own sense of what is, you know, ethical to everybody. You have to be willing to see that people have different kinds of, you know, worldviews. And so finding faults in how they eat or how some group does this or that, it, you know, it's, it's, it's futile. It's like trying to wash a mud wall. If you try to wash a mud wall, what happens? It just disintegrates. So he says, subdue them with kind words and gifts, for they will never bend to anger. Turn them into a shield and use them to plunder your bordering enemies. Now this is now he's he's you know he's a good politician here. So the the forest tribes would often be the hill tribes would also you know act as a kind of barrier between other empires. So he says basically make them make them your friend and you know the, the, then you won't have to deal with you know two problems basically. Next one, acting with truth is the only way to subdue the forest tribes. Treating ambassadors with respect is the only way to befriend enemy kings. With, win the love of your soldiers by paying their salaries on time. Okay, that moved into... So this is how he gets into many things. But basically what he's getting at in this verse is you have to be honest with people and you have to treat people with respect. And this, I would say, is probably the most important thing. And that gets back to that social egalitarianism thing. Like every person in the the state is important everybody has a place and everybody deserves respect this is very very important and if you read there's one beautiful verse um it's like the uh dinitarium of of raya you know what he does his his daily schedule and you know, there's a there's a great part where he, you know, he, in the afternoons, like he goes and hangs out in 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 the kitchen. He loves hanging out with the cooks. He loves hanging out with like all sorts of people. And you know, as the stories go, he used to go out at night and and, and disguise himself and hang out with with people and you know uh, enjoy music and dance and laughing and drinking and all of these things. So, you know, there was a sense that he was, you know, a man of uh, of the people kind of a king um, and I think that really is important so I think this is the last slide and I think we're almost getting to our time so um, this this is a, a picture of the Vitala temple um, if you've ever been there it's an um, amazing place I highly recommend anyone to visit uh, Humpy um, it's truly one of the spectacular um sites of india uh it's breathtaking it's beautiful it's a sprawling it's not just like one little thing it's just this whole area you can explore this great um place so this is one of the last uh verses that he has in his um rajaniti sections he says support brahmins with donations and ensure your own protection through intelligence. So he had a huge spy network that he had. Um, uh, and that, that's a discussion for another day. But seek eternal refuge in God. For there is only one way to counter the proverb, hell awaits at the end of an empire. R what is it? Rajyantam Naraka. The end of empire is that what he's saying here is, out of all of this stuff, I mean, at one level, I, I've been saying, I'm, I'm talking in Raya's voice, you know, I've been saying, enjoy the, the pleasures of this, do this, do that. But if you really look at what happened, he he spent the better part of his, his, his uh, reign at war. Fighting, killing, a lot of bloodshed. And we have to be aware of this. And he was aware of that, too. And that's why he was saying this is because you're kind of doomed. You're kind of, you know, you look back on this thing and you did a lot of kind of like not such good stuff, but that's what the king kind of had to do to, you know, keep the, the, the empire prosperous and whatnot. So he's saying basically at the end, you know, even with these faults, 
that come with governance. It, it, it's it's part and parcel of governance. If you can somehow try to, you know, do well, uh, at least in some kind of spiritual way, by seeking some kind of internal peace, then you can overcome these things. But empire, and this is something we all need to th think about today, you know, empire, militaries, violence of any kind, is is this where we are we are headed? Is this where we're doomed to always be, or is there some other way that we can, you know, evolve? And I think there is, and I hope there is, because as much as we still draw on all these things, we're always reformulating, we're always moving forward, we're always doing something new and different, and hopefully, we pray that we can evolve to a higher state when we won't need to have as much of this uh, violence in our lives, and we can have more shanti. And more peace and more poetry, um, which is what Raya did towards the end of his life when there was a lot of peace in the empire. Uh, I, I, I do believe that in the later days of, of, of his reign, when things were quieter, um, this is when he spent time writing poetry, uh, supporting the arts, uh, building a lot of tanks for people, supporting agriculture. So anyway, I think that's the last slide. Yes. And we'll end there. I will stop sharing. And thank you very much.